This is the Bulls Talk Podcast presented by Coors Light. I am Jason Goff, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Chris Patola from Sirius XM and ESPN. Coming up on the show, we'll discuss LaMelo Ball, Obi Toppin, James Wiseman, and other top draft prospects for your Bulls fans' pleasure, and also discuss the life and legacy of the late John Thompson. Born in the Rockies, Coors Light is lagered cold for a crisp, clean taste. Filtered cold to ensure clarity and brightness. And packaged cold for peak refreshment. Because those who thirst for more deserve the world's most refreshing beer. Welcome to another edition of the Bulls Talk Podcast. So happy that you can join us. And as always, we bring you, you know, decent enough Decent enough guests uh, this time around. <laughs> a, a guy who I appreciate. You know, we, we got a lot of friends in the industry, guys who like you know you don't link up with, but you appreciate them, you respect their work, and you've worked with them before, and you know they're solid dudes. This is one of those guys, ladies and gentlemen. Chris Patola, welcome him to the podcast. Chris, thank you so much for joining me, man. Uh, back in our days of hosting a serious XM together and you know chopping it up about hoops, I, I can't think of another dude that I appreciate. The the, the, pro, the the perspective of uh, more than you because you've coached it, you've scouted it, you've talked about it, and now you're you're uh, you're on the other side. You've been on the dark side for a while now. So let people know where they can find you before we get into this conversation. No doubt, I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chris underscore okay, that, no. That's the wrong one to lead with these days. Yo, <laughs> yo, you're right. No, I, you know, what's funny, man, you, the thing I love about Jason golf, cause I, I, I feel the same way. I, I respect talent. I don't care where you're from, who you are, bank sure. account, what you look like. If you're good, you're good. And I, that, that's, that's how I feel about Jason Goff. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about Atlanta. I, you, know, <laughs> I know that, you can talk but, about whatever you want to talk about. But I know, the world. <laughs> I, Jason Goff, when I just got out of coaching, just left Duke, and I know Jason hates Duke, so do that. that was even hard for him. But Jason no, brought me on his show down in Atlanta, and that's how I got to know him. So much respect to my guy, Jason Goff, no <laughs> doubt about it. You can catch him on the ACC Network, on ESPN. You can listen to him on SiriusXM. Uh, Chris, let's jump into it, man. It's, it's hard to scout. It's hard to try to figure out who's the next talent, who's the next franchise cornerstone. I would think that it is um, it's five times as hard trying to do this through a pandemic and mm. trying to, you know, just watch as much film as possible and talk to as many people as possible. How would you navigate these waters? Because the Bulls, as you know, have the fourth pick overall. A lot of, a lot of people in the city are very excited about the, what can happen with this pick, whether it be trading it for a veteran or adding another young player to this roster. What are the challenges do you, that you think basketball people are facing right now in this pandemic in terms of projecting the growth of some of these guys? Well, you know, I think it's, it's a product in part of the pandemic, Jason, but I think it's also a product of the way in which the NBA drafts now. Um, you know this, the, the NBA draft it, it has become much more of a projective proposition than an evaluative one, mm. which is to say we are drafting these guys so young. Um, you, you know, you're talking the majority of the lottery, certainly, but even into – the, the, the middle part of the first round, you're talking about freshmen and sophomores or international prospects. So it, it's not even, you know, again, it's hard under normal circumstances, but given the pandemic, you don't have an NCAA tournament, which does produce some moments of evaluation that help. But it, it, it's so much of a projective process. And I, I think in the case of this profile this year, it's even more so because you don't have those givens. You don't have a John Morant or a Zion Williamson. You have a lot of guys whose floors are not starting nearly where those guys' floors started at. And their ceilings may not be as high as those guys' ceilings were projected to be. So uh, I think even this year it's harder because it's just not as good a class as it's been over the last couple of years. Yeah, and that being said, you know, there's, there's knocks on each player, and we're, we're talking about 18 to 22-year-olds, so these guys aren't close to being the finished product. But what I'm seeing about the guy who I want to start with you with, uh, the wooden player of the year, the 22-year-old, Obi Top, and the old man, and I know how you feel about grown-ups on a, on, a, on a court with kids. Like, Obi Toppin was a grown-up on a court with kids this last year, but a lot of people feel like they know what his floor is, but his ceiling may not be as high 
die because of that age. What do you say to that? And is there any validity to the, to the things that, that people are saying right now about the young man out of Dayton? There are so many unknowns contract to contract right now in the NBA. Jason, I don't care if a guy's 23. I don't care if a guy's 29. If a guy can play, put him on my team. Now, not only was he 23 playing against young guys in college, he was also playing in the Atlantic 10, which that means something. Uh, you know, I hate to say it. God bless the A-10, but it means something. Yeah. Now, let's start with the positive, okay, because there are going to be some guys that we probably discuss where – this won't be the case. Dayton had an ex a historic year. They would have been a number one seed in the NCAA tournament if we had had one. They lost one game all season long, and that was largely on the backs of Obi Toppin. They had other good players, but Toppin had a phenomenal year. Now, he swept most of the player of the year awards in college. He did not strike me as that kind of a guy. Like, you know, Jason, there have been guys who have swept every player of the year award, and there was no question – that that dude deserved to do that. Anthony Only Davis. Toppin had a great – you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he ain't Anthony Davis. Right. So, like, I'm, like, swept all the National Player of the Year awards. Good player, uh, potentially a very nice role player slash starter in the NBA. Um, it's, you're going to have a hard time figuring out exactly where you can use him offensively right. because people fell in love with the open floor dunks going through his legs. He's not that athletic in the half court. They moved him around. They were able to do that in that league, use him in different ways. Defensively, it's a concern. He's a little bit stiff. He doesn't move laterally all that well. He's good north-south. He's not great laterally. So, look, I have no problem taking him, especially if I'm Golden State and I just want to plug a guy into a, playoff, a ready-made playoff team. But if I'm the Bulls and I'm trying to get a prospect here – somebody with a little more upside, I think you can find that outside of Obi Toppin. Break that down for me. Uh, athleticism in the half court as opposed to a yeah. uh, fast break situation or a running situation. Well, it comes down to what are you doing in traffic, right? So he's, he is, he's not great putting it on the floor. And to Anthony Grant, his coach at Dayton's credit, he used him in the post. He used him in the pick and roll. He put him in spots where Obi couldn't really screw it up. And again, Obi had good size, good length, and a good skill set in that league. So, again, handling, breaking a guy down in the half court where everybody's loaded up, as you know, and then trying to get to the rim and finish. It's not to say he didn't. But it wasn't – every bang-bang you saw was in the open floor, oh, my goodness, windmilling – he wasn't doing that stuff in the half court as much. You know, he was catching, you know, some lobs, catching off of, off of other guys, penetration, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, not a great jump shooter. So, you know, there's that. He just – there's an offensive game that I think the numbers are going to look better than what you actually might see come NBA time. Yeah, I uh... – <laughs> most, most bad basketball conversations I get into happen at the barbershop. Uh, and, 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 and very recently, I got because I got a LaMelo Ball comparison for you that I can't wait to, to bounce off of you because I brought your name up in this conversation. And the dude was like, who? And I'm, I told him, look you up and look you up. <laughs> he actually, he actually, uh, the next week I saw him, he's like, oh, you're mad. I'm like, yeah, I'm telling you, this is the dude because he knows about this guy. But I'm going to get to the guy he compared LaMelo Ball to. But uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of like poor man's Amari Stoudemire stuff when it comes to Obi Toppin. And I, I would liken it to, a guy who was Amari's teammate. Because Amari Stoudemire was a phenomenal player, right? Defensively, he had his, he had his shortcomings. But I don't think, like, for that little burst, that, that comet that we saw for those four or five years where Amari Stoudemire was healthy, that, that's, that, those are lofty goals. What do you think of Sean Marion in terms of a guy who, you know, was positionless but found himself to a couple of all-star games, uh, had, a, had a, you know, a, a shot that you wouldn't teach, but he could replicate it enough with good enough mechanics and get it all fast enough to become a reliable three-point shooter, you know, well deep into his career along with his defensive prowess. Is that the kind of guy? Because I think in these drafts where we see guys like drafted fourth or drafted fifth, it's not the same four, right? It's not the same five as the Mel Hello, Wade, Bosch, you know, LeBron draft. So when we talk about the values of draft, do you have to kind of, do you have to recalibrate the expectations as a fan? Because you understand that just like the Anthony Bennett auto Porter draft, where there could have been several guys at number one and Anthony Bennett just happened to be the number one is, is, is scouting really going to 
you're really going to unearth the value in this in this draft more so than others. Yeah, it's a it, beauty becomes in the eye of the beholder. You know, like again, I just keep using Zion one to piss you off because he's a Duke guy. But but <laughs> two, stop saying that. People are going <laughs> to start believing you if you keep saying that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To, you know, but part of it's to get under your skin. But part of it, you know. He was beautiful no matter what eye you were looking at it with. Right, Even with right. facing golf eye, Zion was beautiful. But in this draft, like, you're going to have to find how a guy plugs in. I think Sean Marion's a really good example. It's funny to say this because you mentioned Sean Marion as a shooter in the form. Sean Marion actually ended up becoming a pretty decent perimeter yes. shooter. Yeah. <laughs> OB ain't there yet. So, like, that's where I think it, it, it might fall a little short, although he is a little bit taller. Um, here's the thing. This is the perfect – again, I would not take him if I was one of these teams in the lottery – in the top five outside of Golden State. Because Ooh. Golden State, again, you're bringing back Steph and Clay, two Hall of Famers, to a team that's going to make the playoffs. All you have to do if you're Steve Kerr, you plug Obi Toppin in. He knows how to play. He's 23 right. years old. You know what I'm saying? And you can use him in a bunch of different positions in that sort of system that they have. Outside of that, you know, again, he's going to be, I think, a really good role player. But the ceiling of Obi Toppin compared to some of these other guys in this top five to lottery, I don't know if it's quite what those guys have. So I think of the conversation that we had about Kyrie Irving and, and the ones that I've asked you to repeat several times at every outlet that I've ever been at because of you witnessing his workout before he became a Duke Blue Devil. Um, a guy the other day said that LaMelo Ball, he was having a conversation, a guy whose basketball opinion I trust, I won't out him right now. He's like, LaMelo might be a six foot eight Kyrie Irving. And I said, if that's the case, then LaMelo Ball is going to be one of the best point guards of all time because Kyrie Irving's, his handle is uncanny. And I've been, you know, I've argued this before. It got cool to say that Kyrie has the best handle in the game. But I, since Isaiah Thomas, I don't think that I've seen somebody who manipulates the ball as well as Kyrie Irving does, especially with the layup package and everything that he presents. Uh, when you look at LaMelo Ball and the size and <clears throat> the room to grow uh, and already what he understands about hesitation, stop and starting, uh, those kinds of things. And, you know, the, the scores mentality that he has had up until this point, we, who knows, because Lonzo scored 30 a game in high school, and then you, you filter into whatever role the, the game needs you to be to be uh, productive. But when you look at LaMelo Ball, uh, it seems like he's going to be the number one pick unless something changes, uh, at least top two or three. What do you see in his game right now that can transfer to the NBA? And obviously, what do you think he has to work on? You know, the thing with – here's the thing with Kyrie, and I think where the, the comparison is – it's the only way that the comparison works. And I've said this to you about Kyrie. Kyrie was a savant. So Kyrie was like the guy without taking a lesson who could sit down at a piano and play you a concerto without – he just sits there and he sees it. You know what I mean? It just does it. Like that's how – Kyrie was not a great worker. He just showed up and could ball. He was a savant. LaMelo's been raised in the game, obviously. And I think, I think people who are listening now need to understand LaMelo Ball is all grown up now. Like, he's no longer that blonde-haired with braces kid who's following his dad and Lonzo around trying to start the big baller brand. Like, LaMelo's grown up now. So and he, there's a natural gift to his game. Like, there are things he intuitively does that come naturally, and part of it's being raised in the game. But there's a lot this dude – and so there are things you don't have to teach him. But there's a lot this dude needs to learn about playing the game of basketball. And I think the first thing people need to understand, you know, when you talk about international, playing internationally versus the college game, you need to understand the translation. Luka Doncic playing in the Euro League and winning the MVP was on another level, one of the most accomplished international prospects we've ever seen. The league that LaMelo Ball's been playing in for the last couple of – doo-doo, doo-doo, and his team was doo-doo. His team lost. So there were a lot of things that you're going to see on tape that LaMelo got away with where there was no, there was no risk. So there was only high reward. You know what I'm saying? So he's good with the ball. He's very good in the pick and roll. But here's where the, the, the comparison to Kyrie drops off. Kyrie is as strong as a bull. LaMelo is not. LaMelo is going to get knocked off defensively. I worry about him. You think Lonzo's bad defensively and gets picked on. LaMelo's going to be similar. 
His shot selection is wild. He's not a great shooter to begin with. So I like his talent. I like his, his intuitive feel. Here's the other thing. He, he genuinely loves to play the game. So you got no concerns about him being in the gym, love of the game. He loves the game, but there's a lot he's got to learn how to play it. There's always a guy that I ask you about. And when I was hosting on Sirius, I used to ask you about who should I be watching? We, we, we talk about everybody, but you always gave me a team or a guy that I should be watching that's on the rise. Uh, you know, we've been watching some more of Isaac Okoro's tape in terms of him being a three and D guy. If the Bulls would have stayed at six or seven or where they were projected to get, I, I was eyeing Tyrese Halliburton because there's something funky about that herky jerky game that I like. And on top of it, I feel like there's a lot more playmaker in him than score. So he's a guy that I thought would be easily, you know, placed next to Kobe White or Zach Levine and say, go guard the guy that you can't go, that they can't guard, that kind of vibe. What are some of the names or who are some of the guys that you look at and go, okay, this might not be a dude who might got to go top three or four, but this is a player that's, that's, that's going to make his name known in the NBA before long. Yeah. Well, the first guy I'll, I would say is Anyeka Akangu. Mm. And – you know, it's out of USC. And it's interesting because a lot of times when you pick high, basically because of what you just said, you get bullied into taking certain guys. Right. Like, I think James Wiseman's going to be a good player. I think physically he looks like he should be a good player. But if you watched him, in, and people only got four games. Remember, he only played four college games. If you watched him in high school, that dude's got a long way to go. Now, you got to – but you can get away with taking that dude in the top three, James Wiseman. Right. Right. Anyeka Okongwu, I think, is the prototype center right now in the NBA. He rim runs, outstanding athlete. He's jumping off a pogo stick. He blocks shots. He does have both hands. Like, this dude, I think he's a souped-up version of Clint Capella. Like, I think he'd be, he could be a better version of Clint Capella. Now, I know that doesn't necessarily help the Bulls because Wendell Carter may fill that need. But to answer your question, Anyeka Okongwu at a USC is a guy that – if you chose him at one, two, or three, people would be like, wow, what a reach that was. Hmm. But in this draft, to get a guy that I think fits in, plugs in perfectly, like, again, Golden State, for example, who could get away with, with making that pick, mm -hmm. I think he's perfect. I think he's a guy that, that you have to take. And then the other guy who folks probably may not have seen a lot, if you're looking for the best shooter in this draft, is Andrew Naismith out of, out of uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, pretty good size, not a tremendous athlete, not a guy who's going to put it on the floor a whole lot. Um, but the commodity of shooting the ball in the NBA, it's why Cam Johnson out of North Carolina went in the first round last year. Yeah. The, the ability, and he was the best shooter in last year's draft, the ability to shoot the basketball in this NBA, it, it, you have to have it. This guy has it in spades, but there's also a basketball player in there. He's not the guy you stick in the corner and say, okay, make threes when we pump it out to you. There's also a basketball player behind him. He's still pretty young. That's another guy that I would I, I got my eye on. Now, this podcast people will be listening to on Tuesday morning. Uh, full disclosure, we're, we're taping the day before. And this morning, Monday morning, uh, we got the unfortunate news of John Thompson's passing. And I, I know uh, as a young broadcaster, and I don't know if I call myself a journalist, but as a young broadcaster running into him at Final Fours and him – sharing whatever little nuggets that he could on Radio Row. Um, he was, you know, it's a man that spoke very few words, but all of them landed with me. And he, he, he told me a few things as he saw, like, I was one of, you know, many of the young black men and women on the floor or, or, or running around trying to get tape and all these things. He always said, don't quit. And, uh, you know, you, you have a responsibility. And at 20, you know, 26, 25, 24, I didn't really understand what that meant. Uh, but John Thompson was important to not only college basketball, but a lot of people who, you know, you know a, lot of, a lot of guys shine light on how important they are. And then some people shine, shine light for them. And I think John Thompson is that dude. And he was also a guy who held everyone accountable around him. So he was, he was one of the few guys who would check things when they weren't uh, kosher in terms of, you know, threatening to walk off of courts because his players were being badgered. Uh, the Allen Iverson incidents when, when, when Allen became a Georgetown Hoya and some of the things that happened at Villanova and other schools and him saying, I'm not going to have this. And also 
him checking the community too. Like he's one of those dudes who um, who could do both those things and was respected, right? Like, I mean, uh, let's keep it funky. You know, Bill Cosby said a lot of things about young black people, young, young black women, and young black men in the culture. And we were, and people were like, wait a minute, hold on now. You're supposed to, you know, if you're going to check us, make sure that you check us in the right way. And now we see, you know, on the other side of, of his career, what his life was about. John Thompson was one of those rare dudes who checked other people and checked his own community and also tried to make sure that things around him, uh, you know, ran the way they should. I mean, I, I've heard that the story of John Thompson handing his players a uh, deflated basketball, you know, during their first practices and saying, when the air goes out of the ball, what do you have? And, and, and making sure that hit home for kids who were landing in Washington, D.C., just thinking they were coming to hoop. You know, I thought, I thought Georgetown was a historically black college and university until I was about 15, 16 years old because I, didn't, I did not see one white man on that team. So, 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 for years, so for years, I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? They got something going on in D.C. Only to find out that the, the black people on the campus were on the basketball team. So, 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 so and shout out to Victor Page. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, if you want to say anything about John Thompson or, you know, good, bad, and different, whatever the case may be, but what does John Thompson represent to basketball for you? Well, you can't tell the story of basketball without including John Thompson. I mean, that, that's how iconic he was. Um, I mean, look, start with the basketball, Jason. Like, in the, mid, in the early to mid-'80s, they were as good as anybody doing it. Yep. I mean, they, they should have won the title. Well, all respect to, to MJ, and it was Dean Smith's first. Right, right. They won it in 82. Right. They won it in 84, and they should have won it in 85. Villanova had to play a perfect game in order to beat them that night. But – I mean, they, they were as good as anybody. What they did defensively, it still stands the test of time. I mean, coaches, you know, Jay, coaches replicated what Georgetown was doing defensively for decades. They just couldn't – they didn't have Patrick Ewing or Alonzo <laughs> Mourning or <laughs> – right. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Discipline, uh, toughness, talent, relentlessness. I mean, that's what Georgetown teams were. And then off the floor, I mean, look, what he saw or thought – was wrong he tried to write it and I'll say look I'll say as 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 the whitest guy that maybe there is in the history of the world my friend <laughs> John Thompson <laughs> believed a lot of the things that I believe to be right about education about mentorship about college athletics about basketball I identified with what he believed in and um you know it, it's Look, a lot's been said about him, but I think in part he was for a lot of years misunderstood. And some of the great icons in the history of, of life, but certainly in sports, are appreciated well after their time. Muhammad Ali being the, maybe the pinnacle of that example. Um, but that's who John Thompson was. He, he took a stand. You go back 30, 35 years, Jason, there was a lot he had to lose in doing what he did. Now, maybe not as much. There was, he had a lot to lose in, in taking the stance he took, and he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, a lot of people in the white community. Yes, and you did. know what? He still did it anyway, and it's good to see, not just today but, but, or, or yesterday, I mean, he was getting his due for the last 10 to 15 years, but it took a while, my friend, for, for what he stood up to. It's crazy. We talk about perspectives and how legacies and history writes – uh, things out for you. Uh, coming up in the business, I used to hear how much, <clears throat> how much of a, and it's making me think about it now, how much of a, an asshole Bill Russell was. And uh, you know how beloved Bill Russell is now. And this yeah. is just 15, 16 years ago. And, and I'll never forget asking someone like, do you know, you know what Bill Russell went through? Like, and now we, you know, the last five, seven years, we're enjoying Bill Russell's laugh and, and hearing it a lot more and thinking, man, this man has one of the, the more infectious laughs that you will ever hear in your life on top of yeah. what he did for his community, well, for this, 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 this country. So when you say that about legacies and history, um, you know, the, the things change once you find out what a person went through, what they had to stay yeah. quiet through, what they got loud through, and how their legacy is written. So. John Thompson, I think, is one of those dudes. Just because you're rubbing people the wrong way doesn't mean it's not for the right reasons. Yeah. And think about it. I mean, Hoya Paranoia was pejorative. I mean, 
You know what I'm saying? Like people, people were pissed about that. And, and again, it, to your point about Russell, it's such a perfect example because it's the same with John Thompson. John Thompson was protective of his program and protective of his black athletes because he had seen for decades how black athletes had been treated, how programs of predominantly black coaches and athletes have been treated. You know, he was, he was a black coach in a world where there weren't those types of coaches. So if you put yourself in his shoes, so, you know, get, God bless all our brethren in, in the, the media business, but the media crucified John Thompson for how protective he was. You know what I'm saying? And for the stand, boycotting a game, who, how could he do such a thing? Right. Well, you know what? He didn't care, obviously. We know that now. But that, that Hoya paranoia was real, but it came from a real place, man. Yeah, no doubt. As we let you go, because I know you got a show to get ready for, brother. Um, the bubble, the, the playoffs, <laughs> yeah. all dropping 50. We got a game seven coming up with Donovan versus Jamal. We've got, you know, the Heat versus the Bucks, And I think the Heat are going to push them all the way to seven, if not beat them, to be honest with you. Uh, we've got the Lakers looking like the Lakers this last game without Dane being on the floor. Uh, what's, stick, what's sticking out to you right now? What are you, what are you sinking your teeth into as we wrap up? Well, the first thing, it's a shame injuries have had, it had its toll. Obviously, Chris Stapps, you know, I thought Dallas, certainly with, you know, the way that Luka's played, Dallas might have had a shot. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned Dane, you know, taking him out of that series. Again, I don't know if those teams would have won it, but I think they would have been more compelling uh, series. And I'll tell you what, everybody panicked after Milwaukee lost game one. I'll tell you what, man, like you, you know this, and the NBA – it comes down to your best players being yep. better than my best players. Yep. And if my best players are better than yours on any given night, we're going to win that game. I don't care who else is on that team and whatnot. And right now, you got the Clips, you got the Lakers, and you got that other dude on Milwaukee who I think are all going to have something to say about this because that's it's tried and true in this league, my friend. Your best players got to be better than my best players on any given night, and we'll see. And that's why I run with you any chance I get, my man. <laughs> my best Chris Patola is better than your whatever. Brother, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. Take care of the family. Always good to talk to you. Even better to see you uh, on this podcast. Um, I, I, I wish you nothing but the best, my man. No doubt, Jason. I leave, I leave better every time I talk to you. I leave, I leave better than I was when I got on. Yes, sir. One love, brother. Thank you. All right, man. We hope you enjoyed the Bulls Talk Podcast presented by Coors Light. Find us on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Subscribe if you like the show. Feel free to rate and review us because you know you like us. New episodes are ready every Tuesday and Friday morning unless some news breaks. Then we'll slide it right to you emergency style. But until then, take care of each other, be safe, and we'll talk to you soon.